much to Greg and his panel there. Fantastic session, that one. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us all here today. And of course, to our online audience, I'd like to extend a thank you for continuing to stay with us as well here at the India Global Forum at UAE 2021. Well, ladies and gentlemen, regardless of whether you thought it was a success or a failure, COP26 was in fact a global milestone, probably bringing about more questions than it did answers though, with some of the world's largest economies still hesitant to bring about the change that everyone so much wants to see. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this next session is going to focus on the role of India and the Middle East and how they can bring about this change through climate finance transformation. And it's a great pleasure to welcome our first guest, who in fact joins us virtually. A very warm welcome to Sanjeev Sanyal, Principal Economic Advisor for the Government of India, who joins us virtually. Let's give a very warm welcome to Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev Sanyal, a very warm welcome to you. And also, we have our next panelist as well, who's also joining us virtually, I can see on the screen, Rudra Dalmia. He is the managing partner of Green Frontier Capital, who also joins us virtually. Now, uh, Rudra is going to join the conversation a little later on when I pull the panel up on the stage. Uh, so just a couple of moments, because I'd very much like to uh, speak to Sanjeev Sanyal first and foremost, if I may. Uh, now, there was an idea raised through or during COP26 by certain experts, I'm not going to say who, uh, however, they suggested that relief to developing countries should be linked with their climate policies. It's actually faced quite a lot of criticism, uh, yes or no? I mean, what, what are your thoughts, Sanjeev, on whether that should have uh, been criticized or not? Very interesting to hear your take on that. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say, uh, let me thank all of you uh, for this opportunity to, to speak to all of you and of course to uh, India Global Forum for organizing this. Um, as far as the comment that was uh, made uh, regarding linking uh, climate finance and climate uh, uh, related uh, relief or aid in general to climate related uh, actions, well, let me say that the uh, Biggest problem is not with the developing countries, really. Certainly in the case of India, we have put in a very big effort uh, and making sure that our Paris Agreement uh, commitments are being honored. So we are building a huge amount of uh, non-conventional uh, green uh, energy capacities uh, all across the country. But the real problem is, first of all, relates to the amount of financing, which was promised at the scale of $100 billion a year, uh, it's not at all clear that that is uh, flowing. I think there is an even bigger concern that uh, the technologies that were promised to be transferred are not being transferred. So I think uh, this question should only be uh, raised as far as, uh, you know, being responsible and sticking to commitments is concerned. Then I think this, uh, this question really is much more seriously to be asked of the developed countries. Do you also think that there needs to be then maybe more transparency surrounding uh, climate finance then? What, what needs to be done? Well, as I mentioned, there certainly has to be uh, a lot more uh, transparency about climate uh, financing. No question about that, but at least there is some discussion happening about this. I think the even greater issue relates to uh, technology transfer. So let me illustrate my point. Supposing you go to a developing country and say that, look, we don't think you should be producing electricity using coal or whatever it is they are using right now, and that you should shut that down and shift to a, you know, using a new technology to produce energy. But then you say, you know, we will give you this, we, we will give you this technology, but you have to pay us royalties, or we, you have to use our standards, and so on. I, we are not doing technology transfer, then effectively what you're doing is carrying out colonization in the name of royalties and patents. So the issue of uh, transferring uh, intellectual property uh, is a very major one. And uh, this, is, you know, this is not the only episode where we have seen this uh, being a problem. We had a recent episode even relating to COVID patents, um, relating to vaccines. 
uh, which should have, in my view, and India made a big and strong case for this, uh, should have just open, uh, you know, allowed everybody to have the COVID vaccine intellectual property so that uh, different countries could have come up with vaccines quickly. So I think if we are serious about this, then these commitments that were made in Paris have to be adhered to. And I would say, while it is true that developing countries should be held accountable to the things that they have signed up to, uh, I can tell you that the bigger problem clearly lies in the in this business of not transferring finance, but much more seriously technology. Very quickly, before I, I bring uh, the rest of our panel up, it'd be very interesting to hear your thoughts on, you know, what can, what can, can countries like India do when it comes to leading change then? So, let it be said that there is no conflict between India's long-term tra uh, trajectory and it wanting to uh, move on to uh, green energy sources. Uh, India happens to be uh, poorly endowed by hyd hydrocarbons. And while we do have some coal, which we, we, may, we may use to some extent to produce electricity, the fact of the matter is India is not endowed with a large amount of hydrocarbons. So it is entirely in our interest to produce electricity from other sources, whether it's solar or wind or, for that matter, even um, atomic energy. Uh, we, we should, um, you know, pursue those sources of energy. So there is no question that we want to move down that path. But as I pointed out in my previous response, uh, the fact is, first, the finance provided for it has not been quite obviously transparently being uh, provided. And the bigger problem is that uh, appropriate technologies are not being transferred. So unless technologies are transferred, this is just another way of uh, creating, you know, a, a, a regime that, uh, you know, a colonization through patents and intellectual property and royalties is uh, certainly not uh, what would be conducive to creating a global community and a global response to climate change. It certainly needs to be a collaborative effort, doesn't it? Thank you so much, Sanjeev Sanyal. Very uh, fantastic to have you here. We really do appreciate your time. We're going to bring in the rest of the panel and continue the conversation, so please do stay with us, uh, Sanjeev. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, you to give a very warm welcome to the rest of our panel. It's a great pleasure to welcome Srinivasa Rao, EY Global Vice Chairman of Global Delivery Services. A very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Srini Vasa, for being with us here today. And now, please give a very warm welcome to Sanjeev Gupta, the Executive Director of Africa Finance Corporation, who also joins us. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do take a seat. And of course, I, uh, I gave him a very brief uh, introduction earlier. A very warm welcome to Rudra Dalmia, who joins us virtually, managing partner of Green Frontier Capital. A very, very warm welcome to you there. And what a fantastic panel lineup we have here yet again, here at the India Global Forum. Uh, really fantastic and uh, such a, a huge topic at the moment, of course. I mean, COP26. Srinivasa, I'd like to start off with you. What are your thoughts off the back of some of the results of COP26? And also, do you feel that COP26 established enough around a global framework then? What are your thoughts? I think the answer is, the answer is very simple. Can you click? The answer is very simple, Laura. Um, I don't think COP26 did very much at all in terms of providing any coherence for uh, the global climate action that is being demanded of both the emerging and the developed markets overall. And I think where COP26 is probably um, sort of hitting an air pocket is the overemphasis on the why and the what of climate action and I think that's as well known as it needs to be in today's circumstances. It's the how 
of climate action that remains a very undernourished topic, and I think Sanjeev spoke to it, uh, whether it is global climate finance, whether it is climate technology <coughs> transfer to the emerging markets, um, there are fundamental and seismic fault lines in terms of where the developed and the emerging markets are coalescing around, um, you know, really galvanizing the transformation in the emerging markets. So, with all respect, um, I think COP26 delivered very little in terms of coherence on the climate financing framework. Such a shame and such, you know, a wonderful opportunity to have done something huge as well. Um, I'd like to quickly head on over to Rudra, who's very patiently waiting uh, on the other end there, who joins us virtually, as I mentioned. Um, Rudra, very quickly, what are your thoughts when it comes to this sense of urgency and some of the results from COP26 as well? Do you think that sort of, you know, how can businesses around the world set up evolving financing networks then? What do you think is the key to drive that change? Hi, Laura. Uh, first off, thanks to India Global Forum and Manoj Ladwa for inviting me to such an important discussion. And good afternoon to all my fellow panelists. Uh, most importantly, from a, so, so Laura, while, while I agree with my co panelists about the fact that COP26 didn't achieve much, uh, I think this has to be led at various levels, this, this entire conversation. I think the most important aspect of this is coming from, has to come from the governments, you know, the more the governments can build in predictability about how will change as learning occurs, the greater will be the confidence underpinning investment, innovation, and future commitments. We must analyze how to support a fair and just transition, which recognizes the problems of dislocation. You know, some jobs will disappear, others will change radically, and some locations may be partially affected, but there will be many, many new opportunities. And uh, most importantly, the international financial institutions will have to step up and provide risk capital. The innovation of global companies working on climate change cannot be restricted to their own backyard. We will have to collaborate, we will have to share, and we will have to develop standards for reducing costs of carbon neutral technologies and means of production. Thank you, uh, Rudra over there. Um, Sanjeev Gupta, fantastic to have you here. Um, let's talk about how local governments and industry can work together to sort of empower communities to drive sustainable initiatives. What are your thoughts on how that can be done? Are you seeing more of that at the moment or not? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I must confess that uh, I have to uh, kind of react a little bit to uh, some of the earlier comments made on, on COP26. As somebody tongue-in-cheek once said that COP26 was a cop-out, uh, cop-out in many ways. I don't think it was that bad. I think uh, the fact that the world got together in cold Glasgow and talked about the challenges facing us achieved one thing, and that is that there is indeed a problem looming. And I think it would be fair to say that once you have recognized there is a problem, usually human beings find a solution to it, right? Maybe the solution was lacking. Maybe uh, it perpetuated, to come back to Srini's point earlier on, uh, the sort of skepticism that one does feel when one sees global agendas being hijacked by narrower agendas. So when you ask me about the question on collaboration, there is, no, there is no argument against it. There is no doubt in my mind that there has to be collaboration. But as my namesake was saying earlier on, Sanjeev, that if collaboration in itself needed evidence or the lack of it, the COVID saga tells us how difficult it is to achieve the desired level of collaboration. So wearing the Africa hat that I do, uh, Laura, uh, I must say that, and as a keen reader of history, that this whole argument on renewables and green energy and climate from a global south perspective 
has its detractors, not because we are not facing the impact of global warming, we actually probably face it disproportionately more. But where the skepticism or the cynicism comes is because we have seen every 20 years a new agenda coming. We saw the Truman Doctrine on aid, we saw the Washington Consensus on trade, and now the Global South is asking, is this another way of perpetuating what Sanjeev was saying earlier on, a pseudo form of colonialism? Very interesting remarks there. Over to Sanjeev Sanyal uh, again, if I may. I'd like to bring you in on this. What do you think essentially needs to and can be done in order to accelerate financing climate action then? Well, first of all, um, when we are talking about financing of a scale, we first of all be transparent about what is exactly happening. If commercial uh, investments are being made, um, you know, a green kind of technologies in say, Africa, India, any such country, then it should not be counted as green financing. I mean, those are commercial decisions that would have anyway be happening. What is so special about the hundred billion dollars actually needs to be clarified in what way is it concessional? Uh, it is concessionary at all. And the same logic applies if, you know, we like to pay royalties or buy certain technologies. Then this collaboration, we could have done that even without having a Paris Agreement. Uh, as I mentioned to you, India is anyway poor in hydrocarbons. So we're happy to move on to uh, non-hydrocarbon uh, based uh, energy sources anyway. So the question is, uh, you need to have an honest discussion about this. Is that look, if there is to be a global uh, collaboration about the matter, then you know, what, in what way are uh, the, the commitments that are being made to uh, the developing world uh, be um, honored? Now, this does not mean that the developing world does not have some commitment of its own. And it has repeatedly shown that we are willing to go out there, go out of our way, in fact, to invest in uh, solar uh, and other technologies. And we are doing that. In fact, we are among very few countries that are actually uh, keeping roughly within the Paris uh, Agreement um, uh, you know, deadlines. Uh, but this has, this has got to be a collaborative effort. effort. Um, otherwise, the suspicion that is being built up, and my namesake is pointed, that uh, this is some sort of a new way uh, of, you know, creating a, a new set of parameters for playing the game. And every time you kind of maximize those parameters and play by them, you can end up with a new set of parameters. So this has, you know, game can't go on forever. Thank you so much, Sanjeev Sanyal there. We move over to Srinivasa. I'd like to ask you the same question, actually. What needs to be done to accelerate financing climate action? Is there a formula? Um, I think, well, I think there are... Um, I think there are three things that need to be done. One, uh, there is a fracture in trust between the developed and the developing markets. And it's not new, it goes back all the way from COP15 to 21 to 26 to the commitments made. It doesn't particularly help that the developed markets uh, cheerfully puffed at coal as they made their way to economic prosperity. And now the developing markets are being asked to shun coal and look at um, uh, fairly significant displacements of communities and um, the coal sector in order to transform itself into a more renewables-based energy sector. Um, the second, um, and maybe going back to the point we said earlier, we now need to start seeing actions from the developed markets on lubricating finance flows into the emerging markets and making available advanced climate technologies to the emerging markets. And we haven't seen, there's been a trickle of those, 
but there aren't enough proof points. There isn't a body of evidence that uh, provides any degree of confidence that that is a movement, a motion that is underway overall. I do think the emerging markets have a duty of care as well as recipients or uh, future recipients of finance and technology to build, construct, and maintain a simple and minimalist policy framework that enables these climate finance and technology flows to arrive into the emerging markets without very many regulatory constraints and complexities, which has been a pebble in the shoe for many developed markets over time. So those would be the top three I would go for. Very well said. Sadly, we are running out of time. I'm conscious of the time. Uh, so very quickly, uh, Rudra, if you're still there, I'm hoping your connection's okay. Uh, very quickly, um, how do you feel, or what advice can you give to companies that are looking to attract more investment and support from their shareholders in this move to a more eco-friendly practice? So, you know, as I said earlier, I think once the government's policies become clearer and support for this specific sector becomes there has to be some and, and this goes back to you know what, what Sanjeev said about the fact that you know royalties etc have to go away collaborations have to come in place and standardization uh, across technologies to reduce their costs have to happen uh, specifically in the power generation sector uh, we saw this in solar with the panels getting standardized and the cost reducing dramatically the same thing we're seeing in uh, electric vehicles etc so the only advice i have to companies is you know, uh, specifically that are established that they will have to, to start firstly looking after their current stakeholders, which are the, sh which, you know, you can't stop giving returns, but start investing a sizable chunk of their R&D capital towards developing newer ways of doing things which are you know, carbon neutral, so to speak. But that's the shortest form I can answer a question. It's a, it's a much longer answer. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Uh, Sanjeev, over to you. Final question. Uh, how do you feel that investors can drive this move towards more sustainable practices then from an investor point of view? Yeah, sure. Uh, Laura, very quickly. I know um, we're out of time. I think, you know, uh, let's just put certain things in perspective here. You know, we, we know enough of history to know one thing, that change is by definition evolutionary. It is not something which you suddenly switch off a light and switch on the other light tomorrow. Now, the whole climate agenda, the way it's working, or the way it's being designed to work, is almost expecting almost 70% of the world's humanity, which is the global south, as I call it, to suddenly severe links with what would normally be seen as evolution, right? And what I'm trying to really say here is we must try and stay away from the tyranny of the ore, that somehow it's no longer fossil fuels, it's only renewables. It's not going to happen. Even in the global north, it's not happening. As a matter of fact, I was in a conference recently in Oslo, I was telling Srini, where the oil minister of Norway, of all people, said that we should be careful because we ourselves as a country are still subsidizing oil exploration whilst we are telling investors not to invest in fossil fuels in the rest of the world. So to come back to your question, therefore, capital is fungible. Capital requires returns. But if you are going to put artificial constraints on capital by telling them, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that, I can guarantee you there will be ways and means capital will still find its way. And that is what we have to be careful because a lot of things that should otherwise be done logically, transparently, and objectively will go under the table. And that has its unintended consequences. Thank you. Truly fascinating discussion. I wish, I really do wish we had more time. I cannot thank you enough for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for our panel there on accelerating climate finance transformation. Thank you, thank you so much.